when you put my type of personality with a coach like Rick Majerus, who was a brilliant, brilliant coach, the man knew what he was doing, a brilliant mind, but at what point does brilliance cross into insanity? At what point does rational become irrational? You know, you can't really define that line. But mixing in his personality with mine was a recipe for disaster. On the surface, we looked like a great match because he demanded hard work and effort from his players. And on the surface, we were a beautiful combination. But when it got down to the daily personality uh, flaws of each of us, it, it, it was not good. And, but again, I'd take blame for that. Had I not been so fragile emotionally as a kid, in that when I started playing basketball, I, so, I didn't want people to view me as you know, this deaf, obsessive, compulsive kid with weird thoughts in his head. And so I'd rather they view me as just a simple jock or an arrogant basketball player. And so I put this facade around me to keep people away from me because I was very insecure in who I was emotionally as a person. And so when you take that emotional dynamic up to the University of Utah and play for a guy like Rick Majerus, it's going to fall, it's going to collapse, because he, he does such a good job of cracking, finding and manipulating your soft spots. He knows how to get to people's buttons, and he knows it, and he breaks you down, and after he breaks you down, he's like, yeah, you know, you're not any good anymore as a basketball player. Because, I mean, you get to this point where you're just afraid to even shoot the ball. Well, I can I tell you how I can support that. Last season, Coach Majerus at the St. Louis University, his team set a record low in points scored in a game. I think it was something like the low 20s. And I can tell you why. I know exactly what those kids are feeling. They don't want to shoot the ball. Because when you're the one that takes the shot, you're the one that's going to be analyzed the most in film session. And so you're so terrified to do anything. And so you're like, okay, if I'm not any good as a basketball player, then what good am I as a person? And, but no, that was my flaw. And I, so when I couldn't hide behind basketball anymore, I was so vulnerable that I actually started to break down. And had I been more astute or emotionally intelligent at the time, I could have maybe better handled it. You know, Lance, you're the worst of all. You use your hearing as an excuse to weasel your way through life. You're a disgrace to cripples. And if I were in a wheelchair and I saw you play basketball, I'd shoot myself. This was in front of everyone, the entire team, the coaches, and Coach Rupp. I said nothing, which only made Majerus more angry, as he could never get a reaction out of me. But inside, it ruined me. Here was a man that I had dedicated three years of my life to, that I had idolized, that I had sweated and labored to play for since I was 16. He had turned against me and betrayed me. Had I never met the man, or had he meant little to me, I would have laughed at what he had just said. You never tell your parents of these type of statements of what I will call the abuse that you are enduring. You write in your book that you even, you really even considered suicide over quitting. Why? It, it wasn't so much of a suicide that like my life sucks, no. It was more like I just wanted the voices inside my head to go away. I didn't want to have to be stuck with the what ifs or the little demons inside your head that pick at you. And so it wasn't so much of a, sure I was depressed, but it wasn't more like, oh, just woe is me, there's nothing left to live for, kind of suicidal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I didn't tell anyone or complain about it because, you know, I didn't want to be that kid, oh, mom and dad, the bully said this to me, you know, I didn't want to sound like that. And plus, Majerus was also very good. He goes, oh, Lance, I said that. You can go home and cry to your mom now, the special education teacher. And so he, he, he knew how to do things. He knew how to manipulate, manipulate people. So in a way, he basically challenged me to go tell my mom. And so I wouldn't. And it was ironic because my mom was getting her master's from this very same institution, the University of Utah, in special education. And there's a common misnomer that I filed a complaint against Rick Majerus for a lawsuit. I never did. Uh, we saw his body language change, right. we saw his self-confidence go down, we right. saw that he could not hold on to a basketball. Right. It would be passed to him and it would just go through his hands like butter. He couldn't, he, he could no longer play basketball. So we're aware that something's going on. No, we do not know the degree to which it is and when he finally tells us, of course, it's, it's devastating. And 
he doesn't tell us until he's made the decision that he's leaving. And of course, we're never going to be, you know, you need to stick it out. No, mm -hmm. we just, you're right, Lance, you, you go ahead, you need to leave. I did write a letter of complaint. That's where I think the, the fallacy comes that he um, filed a lawsuit, but he didn't. I just wrote a letter of complaint and asked that it be put in Majerus's file, and I sent it to our major fund provider. Mm -hmm. um, I sent it to the university president and the board of regents. So anyway, it, it, was, it was heard, but nothing was done. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and the leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.